Welcome, Frank Ostaseski. It's wonderful to have you in the Seekers Forum. Mark, it's just really sweet to be with you. I, I really admire your work, and I'm happy to be of some small support. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to start with a general question, and it's one that people put to me very often, and I'd love to know what you would say to this. Why is it that times of adversity are often more enlightening than periods of good fortune and ease? Hmm. Good question. Uh, I think perhaps, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for it, but I, part of the reason is that it calls on our better self, these such times. You know, I mean, let's think about the early days of the pandemic, for example, when we saw people helping their neighbors and uh, uh, helping to make things so profoundly different. I think that's what happens sometimes in in situations like the pandemic as things settle and we're back to so-called normal these things fall away a little bit because we depend on others to do it in, in such moments where our own mm, life is challenged or mm. i think uh, what matters most comes very comes forward yeah mm. so when times are challenging when there's adversity when we're all under duress um, the best comes forward in us i think that's a possibility at least um it's what i've seen many many times we both live in the bay area and so we remember back to the earthquake and back in 19 was 89 i think where people were remarkable in the way in which they helped each other and you know everybody was struggling you know so it was the great leveler in a certain way the mm -hmm. pandemic had that impact as well the difference is though that um, when those things pass, for example, when the pandemic started to pass, for those of us who are, let's say, have a bit more entitlement or have more uh, resources, we want to go back to normal. But the people who are poor or people of color, they're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. You know, we just saw a tremendous outpouring of help for us, and we don't necessarily want things to go back to the way they were before. You know, we want to, we want a new order in a way. So I think that's another thing that happens is it shakes up the, the order of things, the world order of things. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of people I know who are fairly privileged, entitled, call it what you want, uh, told me that they didn't want their lives to go back to the way they were before the pandemic because they discovered things about themselves that were really precious and important. So how can we keep the awareness of adversity um, foremost, uh, in times of, 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 of uh, you know, relative peace. Well, I imagine that you have a group of very progressive friends, Mark, <laughs> and uh, that they're really looking deeply at things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think when we, for example, when we recognize that impermanence is not just a thing that happens periodically, but actually characterizes the, our day-to-day -day experience, we stop relying on things to be so certain. And so um, we live more with a, a quality, with the quality of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I mean, an example being that, you know, I was with uh, John Halifax in Japan a year or two ago, and we were teaching there. And, you know, it was during the height of cherry blossom season. And you know how that is. It's so beautiful, gorgeous. But those cherry blossoms only last for mm, a few weeks. Yeah. Or there's a place where I teach up in the Northwest where these little tiny blue flax flowers outside the cabin where I stay, that only last for a single day, actually. Wow. And the question that always emerges for me is, what's, why are those flowers so much more beautiful than plastic flowers, than silk flowers? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't part of it the recognition of their, um, their temporariness, you know, their, the fact that we know they're going to change, that they won't be here? And I think if we held that idea about ourselves and each other and really recognize ourselves and this life to be absolutely precarious, yeah. then we might really come to appreciate just how precious it is. Mm -hmm. And then we don't want to waste the moment. Then we want to jump into life with both feet. We want to really, you know, attend to what matters most. Yeah. Right, right, right. In the five invitations, you talk about the practice of finding a place to rest in the middle of things. Mm -hmm. How do people, can you recommend ways of cultivating a place to rest in the middle of things, particularly when it hits the fan, you know, particularly yeah. when folks can't find the floor? Well, I'm always hesitant to 
give advice because advice is cheap. But um, I imagine that this would be helpful. If we were learning to find a rest in the middle of things when we're not in crisis, for example, mm -hmm. then that habit would be cultivated. And then when we reach crisis or something like this arises in our life, we have that acquired habit that we've trained ourselves to do that. We recognize the value of that. And it isn't that we're going to leave the situation and go, you know, have a nap, though that might be useful sometimes. You know, for example, if we're caring for someone with life-threatening illness, we don't necessarily have that luxury of leaving the person who's deathly ill. But we also know that if we don't care for ourselves, our capacity to care for others is greatly diminished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the final place of rest isn't so much about going away from the situation as much as it is about bringing our whole attention more completely to the situation that we find ourselves in. You know, if we are reading a book, one beautiful book like one of yours, then we want to we want to be completely absorbed in it. We want to give ourselves completely to the book. Or if we're watching a film, we give ourselves completely to the film. Mm. And so in so doing, we're not caught in our distractions and our restlessness. And actually that experience of full attention is very restful, I think. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. That's connected to the stoic practice of amor fati, of loving the life you have and learning to love the, the conditions of your life, you know, exactly as they are uh, in, in um the five invitations, you call it welcome everything, push nothing away. Yes. And so can you give me a sense of how when we're facing really onerous things, do we welcome them? Well, it's a difficult um, invitation. Welcome everything, push away nothing. I mean, does that even make sense? You know, is that intelligent? <laughs> um, but to welcome everything, I don't necessarily... Uh, I'm not trying to suggest that we should like what arises. Um, I'm only suggesting it's here on my doorstep. And what does it possibly have to show me? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm continuously in aversion, continuously pushing away my experience, I can't learn anything from it. And so it's always coming back to haunt me like a bad penny, you know. Whereas when I'm welcoming something, it's a willingness to... Um, it can't be done as an act of will, let's say. Let's think of it that way. I think it can only be done as an act of love. And what I would say about this, Mark, is that the more I am with people, for example, at, at the end of their lives, the more I recognize the importance of that love yeah. and how it, love is not a gated community. Yeah? <laughs> uh, everything gets in. Everybody comes in, in a way. Yeah. And... Um, Ultimately, that love is without reservation. It comes to include everything and everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when, when I live in that, in that way, again, I'm not in an adversarial relationship with the world. Yeah. And so I have more ease. I'm more fluid. I have an ability to respond to things uh, less reactively, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And getting to that point, as everyone knows, who's been through hard times, often requires a lot of a lot of emotion. So I wanted to ask you about dealing, and of course, we could talk for a week about destructive emotions. But for example, fear, uh, which is which is something that folks have been particularly you know struck by in the last few years. If you, I know you don't give advice, but if you were to imagine what might be helpful. Uh, what do you, what, how do you work with fear? Well, of course, our first and natural response is that we want to get rid of it, right? Because, you know, it's uncomfortable. Um, of course, there's a real value in fear. We know that fear alerts us to things, etc. But so how I work with fear is getting to know it. Mm. You know, not by... Um, not by chasing it away. Again, I don't learn anything when I chase things away. When I come to know it, when I know what happens in my body when I'm afraid, does my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth? Do my toes curl? What actually happens in the experience of fear? First of all, I, it's like an early warning system. I get to know when fear is arising so that I'm not swept away in the panic. I get it in its early stages, if you will, where, where it's more workable in a certain way. But that's the first thing is really get to know it exceptionally well. Mm. And then I think 
it requires some courage to meet fear. And I know that sounds like, well, where's the courage going to come from if there's fear here? Mm. But actually, I hear again, I think if we're cultivating this capacity for courage at other times when life is not so ferocious, then perhaps it's there as an ally for us. I think this courage, you know, we normally think of courage as warrior courage, you know, the, the soldier or the policeman or the, you know, first responder who has courage and overrides their fear in order to be of uh, some help to others. And the problem with that particular type of courage is that it's easily manipulated. You know, people can be, um, yeah, their, their, their motives can be manipulated, actually. And so I think it's important to um, cultivate other aspects of fear. You know, we often speak of courage of the heart, right? The ability to receive with an open heart whatever's coming you know, to uh, get familiar with the emotional state that we were speaking about a moment ago. But then, then there's another courage, which we rarely speak about. And I think it's the courage of vulnerability, which is the ability to be vulnerable. And of course, we don't want that. We imagine vulnerability as weakness, and it's, you know, um, terrifying to us in some way. But actually, for me, vulnerability is one of the most beautiful of human capacities. Mm -hmm. Because it, what it does, and I'm sure you agree with me here, is it allows the beauty and horror of the world to impress itself on our soul mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. so that we can become more porous, actually. That's mm -hmm. what vulnerability enables. And so I think it really keeps us human, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful antidote to fear and to that warrior courage that we tend to think as the only form of courage. And, and I'll say one more thing on that, which is, I believe in my own life that the courage of vulnerability introduces me to what I would speak of as invulnerability. And here I'm not talking about the teenage invulnerability that thinks will never be hurt. I'm speaking about, it introduces us to that aspect of who we are, which is in a way never sick and never dies. Mm -hmm. And it's reliable for us. You know, that's known in the wise heart in a way. Mm -hmm. And so it's that invulnerability that um, I want to cultivate my familiarity with. Mm -hmm. And the courage of vulnerability is what is the gateway to that. It's what introduces me to that. Mm. Yeah. What do you mean by the, the other kind of courage being that we can be manipulated by it? What do you mean by that? Well, think about it. You know, our... Um, sense of nationalism can manipulate our warrior courage you know we can um, we can be manipulated into doing things that we don't don't have integrity for us they don't have moral integrity for us yeah so that's a that's a one example yeah i see i see good so let's talk about don't know mind beginner's mind and how that can help us in times of extreme uncertainty like these we do know so much. And so it's not about suppressing our knowledge. It's about being with the unfolding of the moment and understanding that we can't predict or control outcomes. Is that what you, what you mean by don't know mind? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as you're suggesting, I don't think it's the absence of information. You know, I think don't know mind is kind of off the charts of what we normally think of as knowing and not knowing. Yeah. It's really neither of those. Um, it's a mind that's open. A don't know mind is a mind that's receptive, that perhaps has a sense of wonder or curiosity about it, that is um, not so filled with its knowing that it can't allow something else in. <laughs> so a don't know mind is a mind that's, um, that's receptive, I would say. And I think it gives rise to all sorts of things. You know, um, hmm, here's an odd example, but I was working uh, in refugee camps in southern Mexico, in Chiapas, some years ago, when my son was quite young. He was two years old or less. And all of us, you know, activists were working in this cafe and we were planning on what we could do and, you know, being revolutionaries, etc. And for a moment, I looked, and I thought, where is my son gone? You know, And then I looked around, and I saw him coming out of the Mexican toilet. And he was carrying the plunger. Not only was he carrying the plunger, he was chewing on the plunger. 
<laughs> exactly. And I was like a superhero leaping over tables and chairs and, you know, to save him from this horrible thing that would surely kill him. And as I, as I reached him and was going to grab this plunger from his, from his hands, he looked at me with so much joy, Mark. Dad, look what I found. This is amazing. You want some, basically? And there was <laughs> so much joy in his face. And, of course, everything in me thought this was horrible. All my knowing thought this was horrible. And, and of course, yes, he did have the potential to make him sick. But it stopped me in his tracks, his joy. And this was actually a, a, an example of don't know mind. It wasn't just that he didn't have the information. It was that he was receptive to something that horrified the rest of us, you know. And I think this is really important in, in our work, in our lives. You know, I, I often say that, that love is the fuel for the journey, right? You know, if you, there's a mountain lake that you love, you, you know, you got to love the lake in order to make the climb, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have to love the climb. Otherwise, when the mosquitoes come out, you're going to turn back. So love is the fuel for the journey, but joy is the spark that ignites that fuel. Yeah. And so often for me, don't know mind um, gives rise to that curiosity, to that joy. I mean, if you look at kids playing, they don't play for a purpose. They just play to discover. And so don't know mind has that quality about it. It's a mind of discovery. Yeah. All right. That's a lot of words. Stop. There. No, beautiful. And so both are true. So we can know what we know and have all the information. Uh, and we can also live in a spirit of discovery and not attaching to, you know, fixating on negative outcomes and, and the stories that the mind creates. Exactly. It's, so it's a paradox. It's a paradoxical way of being. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, you keep your knowing, not throwing out knowing. Right. We're keeping it in our back pocket and we will use it reliably when required. But, um, you know... Not knowing is, don't know mine is not ignorance. Yeah. It, is, um, it is open receptivity. It is curiosity. Yeah. 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 So I'd love to ask you a couple of personal questions. So was there anything in your childhood that prepared you, to, that, that may, would make you think looking back that you were going to spend a life uh, as a Buddhist teacher, doing service, traveling around the world, working with end of life. What were the predictors in your younger life that, that you think led you to this work? Mm -hmm. I don't know, Mark. I mean, I, I think I meandered a lot in my early years in my life. And, and there's some value in that meandering because it helped me to discover, I would say. As a boy, I grew up on a large country estate my father was a chauffeur that worked for the people who owned this massive 500 acre estate on the land. And, um, and so the only thing I would suggest in that is that two things. One, I was surrounded by beauty and the beauty was actually, beauty saved my life, I would say. Yeah. Because during the harsh times, during things that were unpleasant in my life, beauty was there as a kind of respite and a reliable uh, friend, I would say. So that's one thing for sure. Um, the other is that in, in my later years, my teenage years, I was subject to awful things. My parents were alcoholics and they were violent. And uh, I was, um, I turned to the church for solace and I was sexually abused over and over and over again by the priest that I placed all my trust in. So I think that these things, the suffering that I was subjected to and exposed to, helped shape me, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I learned as a result of that later in my adult years that I didn't have to turn away from suffering, mm -hmm. that there was some capacity in me to be with suffering. At first, it was just endurance, honestly, mm -hmm. as a younger boy. But then later I learned how it was possible to stay open to suffering and not run away, basically. Um, to stay in the room when the going gets tough, so to speak. And that those, those experiences of suffering that I just named, they allowed me to build an empathetic bridge to other people who were suffering. 
Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I could know their situation exactly, but I, I had a, a hint of it. I mm -hmm. could, I could build a bridge to their experience. And that was invaluable in my work, particularly my work with the dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get one gets more com gets comfortable when you have a tra traumatic upbringing, you know you get comfortable with 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 suffering with with uh, with horror with loss with all the things that men, you know folks with more you know um, charmed you know childhoods never experience. So people like us get comfortable in those rooms. So it's easier, I think, later on to sit with a dying person, to go into a war zone, to work with somebody who's been uh, severely abused. It's not so, it's not as shocking. Do you, do you know no, what I mean? Yes. And I would, I want, don't want to give the impression that somehow trauma is a great thing and that well, if more people had it, we'd have more empathy. Um, some people are paralyzed by their trauma mm -hmm. uh, and are find it, they're familiar with it, but they're not able to function with it. You know, they're familiar with those kinds of crises that we were just naming, but they're not able to function in it. For some reason, and God knows why, Buddha knows why, I was able to be exposed to other things, Buddhist practice among them, that helped me learn how to turn straw into gold, how to turn, you know, that which was difficult for me into something that could be a source a gateway to compassion right 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 we're not we're not we're not recommending trauma we're not saying no. it has a, it's not the magic bullet for awakening but it can be used and, right. and there is i know in my own life there's a familiarity because i grew up in a, with a, in a family where there was a lot of loss and trauma there's a familiarity with pain that has actually stood me in good stead as as a writer as a teacher uh, as somebody you know worked in hospice for years, uh, I'm not freaked out in those yeah. situations in 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 um, ways that I think uh, other people might be. And I and I, I so I thank my yeah. I thank the suffering of my own child. Yeah. For that I mean I, I would add here though that what can happen in that familiarity is that we can also get stuck in our familiar responses to it. Mm. And, um, you know, we can be on hyper alert, for example, which is a familiar response for people who have experienced a great deal of trauma. Yeah. And so we can walk through life with, you know, all our stress hormones firing away continuously, even though there isn't necessarily a, a threat in the making at that particular yes. moment. Yeah. So finding a balance later, I think, is really essential. Yeah. yeah. And uh, often that takes a, a process of discovery, a process of healing that um i mean often when people would come to zen hospice when i was guiding it and they had a lot of trauma in their life sometimes i would say okay come on in but other times i would say this is not a gift to you to do this mm -hmm. there's healing that has to happen for you first and then we'll be here we'll welcome you in but this is not the time to do that your your husband just died you know and i know it was powerful and meaningful for you but no jumping into someone else's death is not the right thing to do at this moment mm -hmm. yeah and I also like to ask you uh, what your own personal experiences of suffering have taught you about uh, humility and wonder. <laughs> well, you're assuming it taught me something about humility. <laughs> I don't know, Mark. I mean, actually, one of the first things it taught me about humility, I take that first, is that I'm not so special. That... I didn't create sickness, suffering, etc. They're part of the human condition. And, um, and so I didn't, I'm in a certain way, I'm not responsible for them. I didn't generate them in my life. I have to be responsible for how I deal with them, of course. But they weren't of my making. They are part of the human condition. Yeah. And so there's a humility in that. There's an ordinariness in that. There's a willingness to just be, I'm no better or worse than anybody else, actually. Yeah. So that's the first thing I would say. Wonder, oh, wonder. I was just talking last night to a friend of mine over dinner about the word wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? We, we speak about mindfulness and we speak about heartfulness, all this, but wonderful. That's quite something when that's, you know, what's our primary way of moving through the world. Yeah. 
Mm. So um, not only does wonder have this quality of don't know mind we were speaking about, that's of course a gateway to it. But um, it, there's something about being with suffering, particularly be, being with death, mm. that has us appreciate the miracle of this life. I mean, the fact that we're able to sit here and have the kind of discussion that we're having, the fact that we breathe in and we breathe out, and we take all of those things for granted. And then when you're with somebody at the end of their life and they can't hardly breathe, oh, wow. And it's not just like, oh, there goes the poor, unfortunate one. It is, it really introduces me to the sense of gratefulness and not taking things for granted. Yeah. So that's... Um, those are qualities of wonder that, or things that have engendered that quality of wonder for me, I would say. Yeah. Mm. And connected to that question, I wanted to ask you, and this, of course, this is another very large question, but mm. can you speak just you know, say a few things about why the awareness of mortality uh, is really essential uh, to the cultivation of wisdom? You, you ask very big questions, Mark. <laughs> This is the Seekers Forum, after all. I have been with people at the end of their lives a lot. I've probably sat with a thousand or more people. And one of the greatest bits of suffering I see for them is not their regret, although that's written about a lot in popular literature. It's that um, they were caught by surprise by dying. That they hadn't ever thought about it, really. And now they found themselves in with a life-threatening illness and days, weeks, months to live. And um, they were caught by surprise. You know, we have this idea that our dying will happen later. You know, later. It'll come later. And that gives us a comfortable buffer between us and death later. Mm -hmm. That little word. But constant change uh, in permanence, as we spoke of a little while ago, it's not later. It's here right now, you know? And so again, the more we recognize that and step into the truth of that, that that's woven into the very fabric of existence, I think, um, one, we won't be so taken by surprise. And also, we'll, we'll recognize the importance of giving gratitude for what we have. You know, my, my old friend, Brother David Stendlerass, he used to say, this, is this, this gesture is the gesture of giving and receiving. Yeah, mm -hmm. Same gesture, open palm. It's only when we curl it back into a fist that we begin to have problems. Either when we curl back in anger or when we curl back in greed, you know, mm -hmm. that we start to have difficulty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the two questions that are often on people's minds at the end of life is not, you know, why I didn't get the second Mercedes, you know, it's, am I loved? And did I love well? Yeah. And the second question isn't really evaluative. It's just the the reflection on the, the nature of my loving, the quality of my loving in a way. So if those two questions, am I loved and did I love well, the most important questions at the end of our life, well, aren't they important now? Mm -hmm. and, and why wait until the end of our life to, you know, practice with them in a way? Yeah. So um, I think that what the awareness of death does is it's like the hidden teacher, you know, hiding in plain sight, reminding us of what matters most in a way. And um, like those two questions, yeah. Stephen Levine used to say, I, I know you, you were a friend of his, as well, that the great American death mantra is, oh, shit, yeah. you know, at, the, at the end of their life, that's what people would say at the end. That was, it wasn't thank you. It wasn't, uh, I, and, I, I, and, I'm in wonder. It was, how did I, how did this happen? And how did it happen so fast? And the, and the dream that we often have, particularly in this culture, is that I'll die in my sleep. Yeah, right. And, and while I appreciate the peacefulness, it's part of that sentiment, I don't want to die in my sleep. If possible, I want to be awake from my dying. It's going to be the greatest adventure of a lifetime. It has inherent in it conditions which are conducive to transformation. And um, 
I'd rather not sleep through that experience if I could possibly stay awake through it. Mm, yeah. mm, mm. Just a couple more questions. I'd like to ask you about optimism and pessimism. You know, mm. Are those words that have any meaning to you as, as, as someone who cultivates, tries to cultivate no, don't know mind and, and not conclude? Are, are, do you, are, do you tend toward one or the other? Do you, how do you teach as a Buddhist teacher around optimism and pessimism? What do those words mean to you? Good question. In a certain way, and they're dangerous points of view to hold. I mean, a pessimist thinks, oh, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And so what's the point of taking any action at all? You know, and the optimist thinks it's all going to work out. Don't worry about it. And again, it kind of freezes us from action. You know, so there's no action that's part of either of those particular points of view, we could say. Uh, Barbara Kingsolver, a wonderful writer that you probably know, uh, she has a passage somewhere in her book that says, I'm neither an optimist or a pessimist, but I believe in hope. And she says, so I think about the winter and that it might get really bad this winter. I mean, none of us may survive it. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'll do is put a few potatoes in the root cellar. In case anyone survives it, they'll find the potatoes. Yeah. So there's an action that's part of that, of true hope, of mature hope, actually. There's a kind of action that's part of it. And um, I think that's more useful for us than these two postures, which leave us not taking any action at all. Yeah. So hope, you don't see hope as part of optimism. You don't think one needs to be optimistic to have hope. Well, in the Buddhist world, um, hope is the flip side of fear first of all and in that particular system um uh we get very future excuse me very object focused we get future focused in hope in that particular model yeah and um you know we even can develop addictions to how the future will turn out in a way yeah it attaches us to expectations and so often in that um model they say, give up all hope. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that that's useful. I think the sort of hope that we were just speaking about is necessary. It's part of our human, we're needed in our human condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I um, years ago, and maybe I shared a story, I don't remember, Mark, but years ago I was teaching at some big hospital in the Midwest somewhere. And I was walking through this big metal and glass building major medical center with the head of nursing for the facility. And as we were walking to where I was going to address, you know, a room full of doctors and clinicians, I heard Brahms lullaby come across the sound system. And it just, and I looked around and everybody stopped. Everybody stopped. They were walking and then they stopped. They stopped their conversations. They stopped. And I said to this woman who was guiding, I said, what's that? And she said, oh, it's Brahms Lullaby. We play it whenever a baby is born in the medical center. How beautiful. And I said, well, where do you play it? You mean just here in the public, you know, uh, corridors? She said, no, it's played, it's, it's pumped into every room. I said, even the surgical units? Yes. Even the morgue? Yes. Every room, every office, every, every room in the whole hospital, the whole medical center. And I just was, I stopped me in my tracks. And again, as I was looking around, I saw it did the same for others. Mm. So I think that this mm, wasn't just a charming piece of music or a charming idea, you know. I think that it, it engendered hope in people in the midst of what we were speaking about earlier, really difficult circumstances, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and for a moment, there was a little bit less tension, a little bit less stress, and there was more delight especially in a hospital or a medical center, which are kind of magnets for suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That there was, uh, there was a moment in which people were not swept away by their suffering, swept away by the problems of the day. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just an announcement of a feel-good optimism. You know, right. real, real mature hope, I don't think it's just that. Hope is subtle, and it's an essential resource in our human life, you know? Beautiful. So... Um, yeah, isn't that a thing? Whoever whoever had that idea was inspired.
I agree. And I've talked about it quite a lot in when I've traveled the country, and I know that others have as well. And so as a result, many hospitals are doing this now. And I think it's just a be- it's become a really beautiful um, a kind of ritual that happens in medical centers, which, of course, you know, can be cold and uh, sometimes trans- transactional. Yeah. yeah. Very transactional. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just ask you one last question. I know you don't like to give advice, but a lot Mm -hmm. of people have fallen into cynicism, uh, hopelessness, you know, pessimism, you know, these days, what is, what, how, what would you, how would you uh, speak to people like that who are really uh, looking for something to hold on to uh, for their, for spiritually and, and for their own, for their survival, but also a, a sense of what is possible. Yeah. Well, I'm really taking your question to heart, Mark, because there is a lot of despair in our culture at the moment. And, you know, it's part of what gives shape to nationalism and racism and the horrible kinds of positionality that we see in our culture at the moment. I don't think there's a simple answer to this, but I I do think it's helpful if we can look and see what has given meaning to our life in the past, even if in this moment it's hard to access. Is it all right with you if I share a story? Please. Um, When I'm with people at the end of their life, that's what I have to discover. I have to discover what gives meaning to their life. And, you know, sometimes it's religion and sometimes it's uh, time and nature. Um, often it's relationships, how people conduct their relationships, I would say. One night I was with this um, woman, Samantha, and I sat with her through a long and rather horrific night as her husband, Jeff, was dying. And they had been wilderness guides, yeah? And um, so their church was the wilderness. Their church was nature. And so I had to discover with her what she loved about nature. And so, of course, I asked her, well, what do you really love about it? And she said, oh, everything. I love it down to my bones. I love when I get soaking wet. I love the cold winds. I love, you know, the, the way smells are carried across from one valley to another. And uh, I said, "Uh uh-huh. And so it gave me a sense of what what she was capable of right then, what was important to her. And then she asked me, what can I do that will be helpful to my husband, Jeff, now? And so I asked her another series of questions. I said, what do you do with your children when they're sick? And she said, oh, well, I I sit next to them beside the bed, and I, I do simple things with great attention. And I sometimes I snuggle in bed with them, but sometimes I just stay beside them and I, I let them know that I'm not going to leave them. I let them know that it's okay that they're sick, that the sickness won't last forever. And, and as she was speaking, I could see her remembering what she already knew in a way, you know? And, uh, and uh, you know, she said when she was talking about the being in nature, she said, you know, I, I like just being in the midst of it all, you know. And so uh, she, when she was talking about her children, she said, that's what I do with my kids, but I don't know how they do this dying stuff, you know. And I said, well, you told me that you loved being in the midst of things in nature, that you loved it all. I said, suppose Jeff is just in a very essential way returning to his nature. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, many traditions across from the Greeks on speak about the four elements as something that we're all composed of the four elements, earth, water, you know, uh, fire and wind. And so I said, "In in a very simple way, that's what's happening for him. This is what he's returning to. And I said, you know, each of those qualities in these traditions, they have uh, a spectrum of experiences, like the hardness and softness of earth, for example. And so I just began to ask her about those 
mm, essential elements. And I turned to her and I said, so was Jeff a solid guy? Earth element. And she said, oh, he was so goddamn stubborn. He was hard headed, but he had the softest skin. Earth element. And that was dissolving. And that gives way to the water element. And I said, um, tell me about your relationship to water. Oh, she said, we were river raft guides. We knew about the ways of the rivers. Yeah. And we used to climb uh, glaciers when we were in Alaska. And I, so we talked about the fluidity and cohesion of the water element. Yeah. And also it's, it's said to have this quality of creativity about it, the way water just finds its way. And so, um, so we talked about this, this particular quality. And then, you know, that eventually, you know, starts to dissolve. And, you know, for example, she'd been giving him little sips of water and chips of ice and things over the last few days. And, and now she was just moistening his lips with a small sponge. And, or sometimes she would wet her own lips and just kiss his. Yeah, beautiful. And what does the water element give way to? Fire. And so when people are sick and dying, often a fever comes over them and their, fever, and their temperature in their body raises or their metabolism slows. And so what happens is that they get cool and moist. And Jeff's hands and, and feet were getting cold now. And the heat of his body was gathering around his big, beautiful heart. You know? Gorgeous man. Mm. And so... Samantha would talk about the passionate, the passionate fire of their lovemaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the cool indifference of their, uh, of those moments when you go to bed with your partner and you turn away from them in indifference. Yeah. It's horrible. We've all done it. And so she, I remember she, she just kissed his head right down to his toes, his whole body. She kissed it and she apologized for ever having gone to bed in argument with him. Uh, and then, you know, the fire element gives way to the air element. And so that's what's happening in the final moments of life. There's just the breath. And it's like that. It's like a little bit like birth. You know, everybody's fit, focused on the breath. And while his breath had been quite erratic and unstable for a period of time, now the agitation which had characterized his experience had all gone and there was a kind of ease in Jeff now and Samantha who was not a uh, meditator you know she was a wilderness guide she she did the most extraordinary thing Mark she turned to Jeff and she said I'm going to go inside now way deep inside myself and I'm going to meet you for one last time mm. <laughs> And I saw her settle into this stability. And somehow, I don't know how, or what it was like, you could feel almost a profound connection between the two of them in this moment, you know. Just Jeff and Samantha and me in the room. And then a little while later, Jeff breathed in, and he breathed out, and he didn't breathe in again. Moments passed, it was silent. And then Samantha, speaking to as much to the space in the room as to me, said, oh, I thought I was losing him, but he's everywhere. Oh, okay. I thought I was losing him, but he's everywhere. Mm. Oh. And it was this kind of luminosity in what she was saying, this deep peace in what she was saying. And, and I think that what happened for her is that she woke up to something very fundamental in her, fundamental to being a human being, in a way. That, that the small, separate self she had taken herself to be had now relaxed, and something much more fundamental and essential came forward, and she could see through those eyes, in a way. And she understood, not in some mm, cognitive or conceptual way, she understood in her bones that the truth of the fact that we are interdependent, that we are composed of the same things, that we are um, not the small self we have taken ourselves to be. And I think when we were speaking earlier about challenges, this is what can happen. 
I think this regularly happens for people at the end of life. I worked with people who lived on the streets of San Francisco. They had no inner life practice. They hadn't the benefit of listening to one of your seminars. They just were regular folks. And yet I regularly saw them go through a kind of transformation that we may think is impossible, or we imagine that it's too late when that happens. And I would agree, it's too late. But here's the thing, if that's possible then, it's possible now. And we need to wait until the end of our life to discover the fullness of who we are as human beings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing, and it is my closing thing. To imagine that at the time of our death, we will have the physical strength, the emotional stability, the mental clarity to do the work of a lifetime. Well, I think it's an absurd gamble, and I don't recommend it. You know, so the time for the conversation is now. Yeah. And that if we have that conversation now, it's not just about preparing for our death, it's about stepping into our life fully. And um with with great a great sense of discovery and and, and gratitude and maybe a sense of awe. Yeah. Frank, thank you so much. What a beautiful conversation. This will be so helpful for people. And I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm really happy to be with you, my friend. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for doing what you do, because these kinds of conversations matter. And uh, I'm so glad that you have a circle of people who are with you that are willing to engage, willing to look, and not wait until they're surprised by death. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Most welcome. Most I'll welcome. I'll see you again soon. I like the idea of that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.